Imagine, demand and build a world transformed. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and thank you very much for joining this evening's event on culture wars and class politics. Uh, my name is Alex Doherty, and I'll be facilitating this evening's discussion. Um, we have a really excellent panel to discuss the topic. Um, our speakers this evening are Ash Saka, uh, Senior Editor at Navarra Media, uh, Lisa Nandi, Member of Parliament for Wigan and Labour's uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary. Uh, we also have Dr Kojo Karam. Uh, Kojo teaches at the School of Law at Birkbeck College, uh, and you may have read some of his work in The Guardian, Guardian uh, The Washington Post, and uh, The New Statesman. And finally, we have uh, Joe Gwinnon, who is Vice President at the Democracy uh, Collaborative, a US-based think and do tank. He's also the Executive Director of the Next uh, System Project. Um, tonight's topic of uh, culture wars and class politics is obviously a tremendously important one. Uh, not long ago, uh, the term culture wars was one used almost exclusively regarding US politics. Uh, but since the uh, successful Vote Leave campaign, we've witnessed increasing eruptions of often uh, confected media furores, such as the uh, BBC Proms controversy. And then we've seen the uh, hostility and racism that has greeted the efforts of uh, Black Lives Matter and other parts of the radical left when confronting Britain's uh, imperial past. Then there's the uh, frequent media attacks on higher education, with universities presented as uh, centres for the uh, dissemin dissemination of liberal and even Marxist ideology. At the same time, we've also seen a ramping up of anti-trans rhetoric on the right, sometimes in a kind of informal alliance with liberal feminists, uh, and all of this in the context of a resurgent right-wing uh, media. So not long ago, the conversation in this area was all about the decline of the tabloid press. But now we see uh, Rupert Murdoch and the owners of other right wing outlets trying to break into broadcasting. And there's a lot of talk at the moment about the launch of a UK equivalent of Fox News. And of course, the launch of Fox News in the United States in 1996 uh, played a major role in the radicalization of American politics. So uh, some of the questions that I imagine we'll be grappling with this evening include uh, whether the left should even be engaging with the right on the terrain of the culture wars, given that it's often claimed that it's a form of political discourse structured to the right's advantage. Another question to consider is whether the uh, so-called anti-woke politics of left commentators such as Angela Nagel uh, have any validity to them, or whether the politics of people like Nagel or the blue labor tradition within the Labour Party represents a politics that essentially capitulates to a perspective that views the uh, the working class or parts of the working class as incorrigibly nationalistic and socially uh, conservative. So uh, before I bring in our first speaker, uh, just a couple of things on the housekeeping front. So we want everyone to feel welcome in these spaces and for everyone's voice to be heard. So please bear this in mind uh, when engaging with uh, the chat or the comment boxes during the session. Uh, please don't use inappropriate, rude or unkind language. Uh, participants who violate these principles may be prevented from further posting, uh, but let's make sure that that, that doesn't uh, happen. Um, in this session, we'll also be using a live transcription service called Otter. Uh, attendees using Otter will have to follow a link and open the transcript as a separate window. Uh, the link will be shared in the chat box by a tech volunteer. Uh, if you're having difficulties, please message the tech volunteer on the chat. Um, also, just a word on the world transformed. So TWT is free for all, but it's only made possible by the contributions of our supporters. Nearly 100 people have joined since the start of the festival, uh, but we need around 50 more monthly supporters to reach our target and fund all the projects that we want to do. Um, so if you're able to, please consider supporting us at theworldtransformed.org forward slash support uh, to help us sustain our work all year round. Um, finally, just a word on the structure of tonight's event. So we're going to start with 10 minute contributions from each of our speakers, followed by 25 minutes where panelists can respond to the points made in the opening statements. And then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, and if a question occurs to you during the discussion, do post it in the chat and I'll do my best to select the best questions at the end. Uh, and so with that, I'll hand over to our first speaker, uh, Navarro Media's Ash Sarkar. 
Thank you so much for that intro, Alex. And I do just want to emphasize what you said, which is that TWT can't survive without your donations. It is the only project of its kind in this country. And where would the left be without it? In a much, much worse place. So open your wallets if you've got one and if you don't, steal one. Um, so I'm just going to jump into it. There's been a way in which most people on the left, and I do include myself in this, this is something that I have done, is, is frame the culture wars as just a big distraction from the real terrain of class politics, you know. And you can see why, there's a lot of truth to this. You look at the ongoing tombola of televised outrage, whether it's vegan sauce drolls or diversity doing a Black Lives Matter dance or Winston Churchill, or whatever's got Piers Morgan's blood up. And you can see that litigating culture is quite a comfortable terrain for the right because they can rely on a skewed media industry to reinforce the kinds of framing and talking points which work best for their agenda. And it's no surprise that when print and broadcast is in a fight for its own survival, that the comment pages of the Times or the Telegraph are indistinguishable from what used to be confined to the weirder corners of Reddit just a few years ago. But I don't think that's all there is to it. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Because if we're serious about the politics that we want, the values that we hold, the world that we want to see, I think we've got to ask tough questions that we might not necessarily have the answers to right now. I'm going to leave it up to the politicians on the panel to come up with the, with the hard work of solutions. I'm just going to do prodding and poking. And I think the first thing we've got to ask ourselves is what, what are culture wars? What really are culture wars? Because there's more going on than just the host of talk radio and morning telly saying things which are deliberately provocative or idiotic. I don't think it's good enough to say that culture wars are just a distraction and that we should focus on talking about the things we feel more comfortable about, like wealth inequality or ecological degradation or poverty. I think that actually culture wars is inseparable from the story of what's happened to class over the last 40 years. Because there has never been an arena of political activity which exists pure and separate from culture because culture and forms of cultural identity that's like the membrane between ourselves and the society we live in right that's how collective subjectivity happens and class consciousness is a cultural process as much as it's a material and an economic one and the people who understand this best are the conservative party the reason why the right and the forces of reaction have stood to benefit electorally from culture wars framing is because they've put 40 years of just hard graft into smashing to bits the institutions which produced class consciousness. So I'm talking about the forever war on trade unions, the fragmentation and the NGOification of the anti-racist movement. I'm talking about the incorporating of a particular section of the working class into home ownership through right to buy and turning off the taps on council housing construction. I'm talking about the demise of heavy industry, the growth of the precariat, the dispersal of urban working class communities through gentrification, the expansion of university education going hand in hand with the blossoming of student debt, uh, lost wage growth uh, for a decade. Because once upon a time, a degree was your passport into the middle class, not so much anymore. And all of these material processes have had a really fragmenting impact on the shared cultures through which we experience class composition. So what are we left with? Well, proximity to manual labor tells you a lot about class, but it doesn't tell you everything. Geography tells you a lot about class, but it doesn't tell you everything. Educational status tells you a lot about class, but not everything. Home ownership, not everything. Race, place, consumer, consumer habits, debt, they overlap, they're interrelated, but they're not a shared cultural terrain which turn these material phenomena into a collective subjectivity. And the fact that the working class doesn't have a shared map of cultural coordinates means that the right have been able to pull off a stunning sleight of hand when it comes to redefining class antagonism away from, well, like, class and this sounds complicated but it's actually really simple arithmetic it's regional accent plus reactionary politics equals working class authenticity 
right? I'm not talking about in reality, I'm talking about, you know, in the dominant political imagination. And it doesn't matter that socially conservative values aren't unique to white people who don't live in urban centers. I mean, you could just ask like one of my best mates who had to get married before she could introduce her boyfriend to her family. It doesn't matter that the working class of this country isn't actually homogenous. This is the homogenous idea of the working class, which exists in political media and is the dominant common sense. It's regional accent plus reactionary politics equals working class. And there's a reason for this that's politically useful. You need this in order to maintain what is an increasingly impossible political settlement, which is you have an entire generation of people, basically anyone under 45, excluded from having a stake in this economy because they don't own an asset like a house, which is appreciating in value. Essentially, they participate in the productive economy in so far as they can feed the rentier economy. It's also an impossible political settlement because look at the direction of social values. For young people, it's only going one way, more inclusive, more diverse, uh, more sympathetic with LGBT causes, uh, more, more, more keen to take on more refugees. It's something which I think is, is unprecedented, is the generational gap in social values in this country. Uh, John Major won a bigger share of the youth vote than Boris Johnson did. Um, and I think it's something like about uh, half of conservative voters own their own home outright. And that's the other bit to the story. Is that when we're talking about generations, we're not talking about, about social values only. We're also talking about a divergence of material interests. One in five baby boomers is a millionaire. Meanwhile, for the young, home ownership has completely collapsed over the last 20 years. And so in order to sustain this impossible political settlement, the right have had to create a new political project. And I've been calling this new authoritarianism and it's a hegemonic project in the Gramscian sense. It's not just about winning elections, it's about transforming common sense. And I would suggest that it's defining features uh, are algorithmic injustice, a strongly partisan or a weak independent judiciary, the use of public money to facilitate corporate monopolies, and also, of course, the rebirth of white nationalism. I think, because uh, I know that I don't have uh, much longer to go, key to this are culture wars, because what it is instilling is a fear of minority rule, a fear of racial, gender, hierarchies, not just being dismantled for the cause of justice, but turned upside down. In some ways, it's a replaying of Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech. In 15 or 20 years, I see the black man having the whip hand over the white man. And the reason why this fear of minority rule is being stoked is to preserve an actually existing minority rule, an impossible political settlement. I don't believe that the left wins by abdicating the terrain of culture, because it means that we abdicate the terrain of shared values and experiences. However, I do know that going along as we have, every time uh, Piers Morgan blows his dog whistle, we all jump to attention like performing poodles, that can't work either. So I'm gonna wrap up here because I think I'm bang on 10 minutes. Um, thanks for listening. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Ash. Um, uh, let's go to our next speaker then, uh, Joe Guinan. Thank you, Alex, and greetings from Washington, D.C., where we know a thing or two uh, about the culture wars. Um, I'm very grateful to the World Transformed for having me here. We at the Democracy Collaborative have partnered with TWT for the past three years, and we're very pleased to do so again. And it's great to see that even under the conditions of 2020, uh, this has managed to remain one of the most important discussion spaces for the left that I know of, at least. Uh, I admit that I hesitated uh, for a second um, to accept today's invitation, in part because this topic of the culture war can be so toxic and noxious and is somewhat removed from my immediate area of work, which is really about alternative economics and community wealth building and solutions. 
But I think this is one of the most important debates we're having at the moment, and this is no time to shy away from difficulty. And the more I think about it, the more I think the answer to the culture wars, to some degree, uh, lies in part in actually having something real to say to the people who are being targeted by the culture war that has just been fought over Brexit and is ongoing. And we've been given this frame of wars and martial metaphors, so I'm just going to embrace that and go with it and lay out my own thoughts on winning strategies and battle plans for the left. And in particular, I want to follow on from what Ash was talking about by saying that actually, I think we need to walk and chew gum at the same time here and really put the class war back within the culture war and make it a war that we need to fight and win. Because there is a culture war raging at the moment, that's very clear. But there's also a class war raging. Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, has said, quote, there's class warfare all right, but it's my class, the rich class, that's making war, and we're winning. Now, the culture war and this class war intersect in very important ways, but ways that I think we really need to understand better as a movement. And I have to say, I'm not particularly hopeful as I look around the UK today in that regard. Today's crop of political speeches and interviews uh, in which the Labour Party is attempting to wrap itself in a, a bigger flag than the Tories, while at the same time looking like it's getting ready to abandon popular policies on taxation of the rich or on bringing key services back into public ownership, are deeply wrongheaded. I think this is a recipe for absolute disaster. It shows me at least that the Parliamentary Labour Party is simple, simply incapable of learning um, the lessons of the past decade. And what they're embracing is the epitome of fighting on your enemy's chosen ground with weapons of their choice and with one arm tied behind your back. We will never outdo the Tories on flag waving and for faux patriotism, uh, nor frankly should we want to. And on this course, I think there's a real risk that we end up with something like the 2019 result in the Red Wall and the 2015 result everywhere else. And if that happens, then to borrow a phrase from our esteemed leader, Keir Starmer, we will deserve it. To win the culture war, instead we must wage class war and vice versa. And on that front, I worry that the current leadership doesn't have either the understanding or the stomach for a fight. So let me be clear and say, I believe there's no alternative but to fight the culture war. We must be absolutely unflinching in our solidarity for those who are being scapegoated at the moment. As our current system, as Ash described it, increasingly fails to deliver for so many, it's throwing up morbid symptom after morbid symptom. And we're seeing major rejections by electorates of a stale elite consensus of which Brexit and Trump are only two of the most prominent examples. And as a result, we're now embarked on this sea of pain. The dark id has been released from the basement of our culture. The ugly language of hatred is abroad with a platform it hasn't had in years. This period's already one of great difficulty and many are suffering. And this pain and suffering is not falling on everyone evenly. And so now it's necessary to defend what we had mistakenly dared to think had already been secured or what we already knew was in dire jeopardy, whether that's the right to vote, to organize, to dissent, to marry, to control one's own body, or even to exist in public as black or brown or female or gay or transgender or Muslim or immigrant without the ever-present threat of violence and discrimination. And as socialists, we must stand in unflinching solidarity in the face of intolerance and hate. At the same time, we really mustn't allow ourselves to be trapped on the defensive. Crises are upon us of climate, of inequality, of racial injustice, and they demand clear and credible answers. And collectively, our task is to craft a powerful strategic response to what is a rapidly changing political and economic environment. And it's worth saying for a minute that I really do think we're dealing with a very deep and multifaceted crisis. I'm not at all sure it's widely understood just how deep this crisis is and is going to be. It has the COVID pandemic and the resulting economic difficulties layered on top of it, but it goes far deeper than that. It goes all the way to the heart of our economic model. And it's been four decades in the making. I think we may come to look back on this period between the 2008 great financial crisis and the COVID pandemic as the bookends of the beginnings of a period of transition from a dying neoliberalism to whatever it is that comes next. And that could either be the more democratic economy that many of us have been calling for or something much, much darker. Britain's already one of the most unequal countries in the advanced industrial world. We've got the greatest regional disparities in Europe. 
Central London is the richest region in Europe, but the UK already also has six of the 10 poorest regions in Western Europe, which include West Wales, Cornwall, Lincolnshire, South Yorkshire, and the Tees Valley. You shouldn't be surprised that we're witnessing a major political and social backlash. Quite simply, the economy has ceased to work for many, many people. Corporate power dominates through lobbying and political contributions. Income and wealth inequality is increasing dramatically. Available jobs are ever more precarious. This is an economy of monopoly power, with a few big banks, energy companies, and retailers dominating their sectors, able to rip off both customers and suppliers with impunity. And everywhere in this economy, wealth and power are flowing, not downwards to consumers and ordinary people, but upwards to economic elites. And the rulers of this economy make their money not by producing goods and services that are useful to others, but through ownership and control of assets. And so we see landlords and property developers controlling land, energy companies controlling natural resources, banks controlling the money supply. And the economy is built around this battle to control assets rather than the creation of new wealth. And it's really about extracting wealth from other people in the economy, from places in the economy, whether through sky high rents, rip off energy bills, bank charges, share buybacks, or what have you. And now we're reaping the consequences of this in our politics, and people are angry, and quite rightly so. And Brexit encapsulated much of this anger, and we, on the left, with some honorable exceptions, I think largely failed to understand it, or at least understand part of it. It was pretty astounding, actually, I have to say, to, to witness the extent to which many on the left, reacting and melting down in many ways over the referendum results, resorted to parroting in return neoliberal economics. Thus, we heard from people on the left that factory mobility wasn't about labor arbitrage, that public services weren't under pressure, that we must prioritize foreign direct investment and trade. And it's little wonder that as a result, we ended up really far detached from our base, parts of our base. Such claims don't match the lived experience of ordinary people in regions of the country that have been devastated by decade after decade of deindustrialization and disinvestment. And faced with concerns about wage stagnation and bargaining power, the right response can't be to dismiss them out of hand by pointing to standard economic models or declaring that there's no alternative to trade liberalization or footloose international capital flows. Instead, and this goes to solutions, we need to be offering real alternatives, including taking the opportunity of this major dislocation in the international economy to talk about a very different way of managing our affairs, including restrictions on trade and capital flows if necessary. Free movement is a major issue, but our solution on the left is not to be found in restrictions on the free movement of people, but rather on restricting the free movement of capital, anchoring capital in place in our communities. And this is where we do have real solutions that we can talk to people about. The work of the past five years has not been for nothing. We went from a situation uh, in which in, two, in 2015, it was unclear what a truly transformative Labour government would have done if it actually achieved state power. And we went from that to having the most advanced version of such an economic program anywhere in the world. And this program isn't just the property of one wing of the Labour Party, it's built on decades of experience with alternatives together with powerful thinking about the crisis that we face and what the deep strategic responses are. And this is the program that the current leadership seems to be in the process of walking away from. For a brief moment in 2017, we almost broke through to people with this program. We saw the greatest surge in the polls and in vote share we've achieved since 1945 on the basis of our then acceptance of the Brexit vote and a raft of, of new economic policies. But then we lost our way and we failed to do some very important things. I think we made a serious mistake in being lured onto the wrong side of the Brexit divide as part of a culture war. Fully a third of Labour voters back leave, but they did so without any, um, any leadership from the bulk of the organised left. I know my time's up, I'll finish in just a moment. As a result, uh, we spent a lot of time on Remain fantasies and we could no longer hear or communicate with sections of our base. And we is we drifted further and further away from them. And I think we've been had actually. I think some of the most vocal supporters of the ultra remain position seem not merely to be willing to sacrifice a prospective radical Corbyn government on the altar of an attempt to overturn the referendum result. They seem to have actually had that as their aim. And now they've killed our chance at a Corbyn government, they seem perfectly content to make their peace with Brexit. Like I said, I think we've been had. What can we do differently? What can we do now? 
I think we should have turned outwards as a movement following the 2017 election results and used our activist army to really make sure we had an activist on every street corner of every community in the country, engaged in deep community organizing, local campaigns, political education. Had we done that, we'd have been far more aware of what was coming in the red wall and we wouldn't have made some of the political mistakes we've made on Brexit. Where does this leave us? Others will be far better equipped to talk about the, the culture war and how to win that. But on the class war, I do think we've got an economics that we can offer to left behind communities. We know that program, we know that it's viable, we have strong evidence for its popularity. We see it already being put into practice in places like Preston, Wirral, Newham, North of Tyne and North Ayrshire through community wealth building. So I think it's time to get back to that, to really uh, turn around and, and address that dangerous chasm between the solutions we know are necessary and what's saleable uh, politically. And that's the chasm that we must close through waging class war, community organizing, political education, base building on the ground. These are the forces we need as part of our answer to a culture war waged from above by a right-wing media. And we need to do this uh, in spite of a leadership that sometimes seems too willing to surrender without even firing a shot. So I know I'm out of time. I'll stop there um, and I look forward to the rest of our discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Joe. I'm sure we'll get onto the question of Brexit in the discussion, uh, but now we'll go to our next uh, speaker, uh, Kojo Koram. Apologies. Um, yeah, I'm using myself for a second. Um, first of all, thank you, Alex. Thank you to my previous other speakers and thank you everybody to joining us um, for the conversation today. Um, as everyone has said, it's a shame that the World Transformed isn't able to meet together in person this year, but it is fantastic that this, this space for debate can continue to be, um, to be made available. In terms of referring to the culture wars and in terms of referring to this kind of yeah trendy framing of um, political um, tensions, you know, one that's very much imported from the United States, from, you know, the late Andrew Breitbart and Steve Bannon, um, I think we need to start looking at what the material basis underneath this framing of culture wars is all about. And I think my first two speakers have already led me down the road towards that. Um, when we're talking about culture wars, we're talking about the lived experience and how lived experience impacts on trigger points and um, confrontations within politics, um, whether that be around gender, whether that be around sexuality, whether that be around race. But in the interest of times, I'm going to focus on a specific area um, around the so-called culture wars, one that has, um, I think, come to dominate the a lot of the debate around the culture wars over the last few months, and that is the question of Britain's relationship to its history of empire. Um, this is something that, you know, is really generating a lot of energy amongst the kind of frothing commentariat, um, whether we're talking about the um, removal of the Gerber Colston statue, whether we're talking about, you know, debates around should rule Britannia land of hope and glory be sung within the um, the, the BBC proms. Um, this idea of um, questions around decolonization, questions around Britain's relationship to empire have um, started to be seen as a real tension point between these um, kind of related interests of material interests, of nationalism and of radical politics. Um, in order to kind of clarify the importance of this, I'm gonna start off with just a, a kind of brief vignette of someone who might not be too popular to the World Transformed audience, um, maybe a little bit more to some of the Parliamentary Labour Party members. Um, I'm gonna start off with a little um, story that's actually from Anthony Blair's autobiography. Um, so it's 1997, Tony Blair is fresh off um, the euphoria of his landslide victory, and one of his first major um, foreign policy missions is to um, uh, go to Hong Kong and facilitate the handover of Hong Kong to China. And uh, what's really fascinating about um, Blair's um, re recapturing of this event in his autobiography is that he talks about how, you know, standing there during the handover ceremony, he, you know, started getting all teared eye and emotional and nostalgic for the British Empire. Um, yeah, feeling real sorrow for this kind of exclamation point on the real end of Britain's territorial empire. Um, 
but once the hand of the ceremony is finished, he goes to a hotel to meet um, the Chinese president, um, Zhang Zemin. And in conversation with the Chinese president, um, Zhang Zemin says to him, you know, well, I hope this handover can be the beginning of a new moment in our two countries' relationship. We can put this violent, bloody past um, of ours behind us. And I mean, credit to Tony Blair for being honest for <laughs> once in this autobiography. He says explicitly he had no idea what um, Zhang Zemin's talking about. He had no idea. He, was, he had no idea what this past relationship that he was referring to was all about. Um, of course, I'm sure a lot of our um, the, uh, viewers today will know that you know what he's referring to is the British Opium Wars in the middle of the 19th century. Um, you know, this is the um, a world historical event by any stretch of the imagination, you know, the beginning of a hundred years humiliation, as the as is known in China, the burning of the Imperial Summer Palace, and I mean, the transfer of Hong Kong to um, British ownership in the first place, you know, I don't know if Blair didn't know about the Opium Wars, what he thought he was doing, um, facilitating the transfer back of Hong Kong into Chinese property. And um, I think that this is a real interesting example of what is actually at stake when we talk about the history of understanding Britain's relationship with empire. You know, here we have a boarding school educated, Oxbridge educated, um, British prime minister, um, you know, facilitating a international um, event with a with a major rising world power and having no idea of the history between those two countries. You know, if we were to have a French president come to Britain and talk about how they knew nothing of the Napoleonic Wars or an American president talking about how they knew nothing of the Vietnam Wars, you know, this would be something that would be mocked, um, you know, by every member of the newspaper. But yet this kind of um, refusal to engage in the history of empire and denial of its significance leads to this kind of parochialism. And Blair's not the only one, you know, we see it with the current um, inhabitant of his office, Boris Johnson, you know, talking about how the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is the same as between Camden and Islington, you know, going to, um, going to Malaysia and, you know, having to be told why audibly singing um, Rudolph Kimpling's The Road to Malay might not be the wise decision. Um, here, we have some of the most privileged people of our society um, with an absolute ignorance about what Britain's role in the world historically has been. And this is at the same time that we are being um, encouraged to um, throw our weight and support behind this campaign of global Britain, Britain leaving the European Union and re-engaging with all of these other emerging world powers, whether that be India, whether that be Nigeria, whether that be China. And yet, at the, simultaneously, we're being told that any discussion of empire is simply um, pointless, um, kind of guilt-inducing, um, you know, liberal hand-wringing that doesn't speak to any of the material conditions of the world that we live in today. And I think that this is a real sleight of hand that's be trying to be facilitated, particularly by the right-wing press that are that are seeing this as, as, as a wedge issue between material interests and kind of cultural interests. Because when we're talking about the history of empire, we are talking about material interests. We're talking about the legal and economic structure of how this country works. You know, we are talking about the relationship of um, why most of the world's major tax havens are either current, often current, or former British overseas territories. Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands. You know, when Labour's last manifesto talked about um, all of these spending commitments and tried to tie them to this um, commitment to, 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 to raise the top threshold tax, um, the immediate response that was um, offered by a lot of the wealthy within our society was, well, this will simply, that wealth will simply flee the country through capital flight to the tax havens, which is easily facilitated because um, places like the Cayman Islands, places like, you know, Bermuda are still governed primarily by the by the Privy Council here within England. So this is easy relationship for the City of London to facilitate. You know, this is something that has to be discussed if we want to talk about really having substantive material change within this country. We need to talk about, um, you know, th again, the role of the Privy Council or the role of London's commercial court and why the vast majority of cases that are heard within there are cases of overseas um, uh, business transactions. This is something that is connected to Britain's particular history as a um, 
as really the facilitator of, of kind of 19th century capitalism, we need to understand the kind of constitutional setup of Britain within itself. You know, the kind of idiosyncrasies of an unwritten constitution or an unelected upper, upper house. You know, this is connected to, you know, the, the kind of great scholar of British nationalism, Tom Nairn, has made clear um, the role of Britain as an imperial power during the 19th century and in the time in which the kind of European bourgeois national revolutions were being undertaken. Um, this defines our constitutional structure in a lot of ways. The Colston removal of the statue, you know, rather than being simply a cultural issue, I thought was also a fantastic opportunity to really make clear the history of the corporation within Britain. The fact that Edward Colston and the Royal African Company um, be betray the kind of colonial history behind the joint stock company and how that emerged into the modern corporation, um, including a lot of the other um, you know, instantiations of that, East India Company, Hudson Bay Company, Royal Niger Company, etc. This did much more to educate us about how our legal and economic structure works than a lot of the so-called um, kind of progressive patriotism and believe in Britain rhetoric that we get from those who wish to oppose this conversation. I think that, you know, we really want to challenge this, this, this culture of parochialism that wants us to blind ourselves to how Britain works and how Britain relates to a lot of the other countries around the world. You know, simply waving the flag and insisting that we all thump our hearts and sing believe in Britain is not going to be enough to deal with these major structural issues that produce the kind of wealth inequality, that produce the kind of, um, yeah, divergence in living standards that we see in the United Kingdom that our previous speaker made so clear. And so I think that um, it's not just the fault of, uh, you know, a kind of right-wing press that's always going to be reluctant to talk about these issues of empire. I think it's also incumbent on us who do want to engage with these questions to make clear the material foundation behind these discussions that we're having. This isn't simply about, you know, trying to be guilt-inducing. It's about trying to elevate the understanding of how this country's legal and economic structure works. And I think you can't do that and you can't challenge these questions of inequality and material deprivation without challenging the history of empire. And so um, I'll leave that there. And um, yeah, we will hopefully be able to take this further in the discussion period. Okay, thank you very much, Kojo. That was uh, that was excellent. Um, our next speaker was due to be uh, Lisa Nandi MP, but unfortunately, we seem to have lost uh, Lisa for a moment. Um, she is travelling right now, um, but we'll try and bring her in as soon as we can. Um, in the meantime, uh, we'll we'll just go on to the discussion, and I thought it might be good first, perhaps, to get. Um, Ash and, uh, and Kojo's reactions to the point that Joe was making um, about the Brexit divide and whether uh, the UK left was on the, long, the wrong side of that debate, whether we allowed ourselves to become perhaps pigeonholed as, uh, uh, you know, metropolitan uh, liberals. And certainly it's, it seems that um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party did come to be perceived that way, rightly or wrongly, uh, by parts of, of, of the electorate. Um, so if we, if we start with you uh, first, Ash, what are, your, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, look, uh, I know you said steer away from rude and un unkind language, Alex, at the beginning, but <laughs> Brexit was a clusterfuck in all directions for Labour and for the left. And I also have been looking long and hard at my own part in this because after the European election results, which were completely disastrous, Corbyn was plummeting in the polls, hemorrhaging support, I thought, you've got to go for it, you've, you've got to go for a second referendum. And obviously, ever since that moment, the exit poll came in in December, I have been really excoriating myself. Did I do the right thing? Did I come down on the right line? And the honest answer in terms of my own personal conduct is I don't know. But I can tell you some of the ways in which I've been puzzling through it and trying to make sense of it. The first way is that I don't think it is honest or accurate to do a bit of class essentializing about who a Remainer is and who a Lever is. Because one, I think that betrays a certain amount of specifically English myopia, right? We're talking about a section of voters and Labour's core support in England. We're not talking about the class status of Remain voters in Scotland or indeed in Wales. Um, when we talk about this sort of metropolitan elite, I don't think that you can turn around and tell me that somebody who voted Remain 
in Broadwater Farm is a metropolitan elite compared to a lead voter in, I don't know, Harrogate or Broxbourne or something, right? We're talking about these contradictory elements of how we attach a uh, class to particular cultural and political si signifiers. These things are unstable. They don't always work out. What I do think is that Brexit did alienate Labour from a certain section of its Leave voting supporters who, who are based in the North and the Midlands. You look at uh, some of the statistics, it also shows you that that support had been declining for a very long time. The only exception for some parts was the Corbyn surge of 2017. But they've been de de declining for a very long time. Brexit was part of a kind of, you know, much more final uh, collapse of that. How do I make sense of the morality of it, the political morality of it? Every single person on the left was faced with an imperfect choice. And they're faced with an imperfect choice in 2016. They're faced with an imperfect choice when it came to what line should Labour take? Is it a soft Brexit? Is it a second referendum? What's going on? For me, what pushed me either way, and I think me and Joe will disagree on this a bit, is freedom of movement. Because we simply did not and could not magic a pro-immigration common sense into politics in this country. And I think we tried a lot. I think we tried a lot. We tried to decouple it from the EU. We tried to lean into some of the more internationalist bits of the conservative rhetoric about openness and fairness for you know the countries of Asia and for Africa, and it didn't fucking work. And the reason why it didn't work is because that pulse of xenophobia, and it's a xenophobia which is also very real on the Remain side as well. It cuts across the Leave Remain divide is so strong. And you cannot simply invoke solidarity, I think, where the institutions to nurture that solidarity do not exist. Okay, thank you, Ash. I think we're going to have to come back to this uh, question because I think we have uh, Lisa and Andy back with us. Uh, so, uh, uh, to Lisa, we may not have video, but we should have audio. Hello, everyone. I'm really, really sorry about this. I'm, I'm on a train. I'm dashing home. Got all sorts of things going on at the moment, but hopefully, a little bit of this will work. And I'm following this debate with real interest. And um, I just wanted to start by saying that I absolutely agree with Ash and one about the Brexit debate. I, I think the culture wars in Britain are here to stay, um, and I think that we are. Um, going to have to learn how to deal with them on the left. Um, and um, I first started to realise that when I saw David Cameron become the first Prime Minister to take to the dispatch box and in my lifetime and use um, a, a racially divisive language, if not more, against Sadiq Khan, um, effectively ruling him out from being Mayor of London on the basis of his religion and his ethnicity. And over the last few um, months we've seen this more and more with not just this issue about statues but also there's been attempts to divide us on LGBT rights, on trans rights, to try to pit women against trans women um, and to try to pit the left against one another. I, I think we have to get used to this, this is here to stay when I talk to international partners and counterparts particularly in the United States on the progressive side they know that these things are here to stay and one of the key things that is really important is that you don't lose your values, that you never ever stop standing up for people who most need it. And that during the leadership campaign, trans rights became a real issue, but I absolutely refuse to back down on my belief that trans women are women and trans men are men, and that it must be perfectly possible to find a way through this that respects and supports some of the most persecuted people in the country. Second thing I would just say is that do not fall into the trap of believing that there are them and us. The statues debate that Boris Johnson tried to ignite about um, pulling down statues of Churchill because we don't want slave traders and slave owners uh, celebrated in Britain. He was the only person doing that. Actually, if you come to my hometown of Wigan, we've only put two statues up recently and one of them was to the men, women and children who powered the mining industry in recent years. The other 
was to Billy Boston, who many of you will know was um, one of the best rugby league players that this country has ever produced and uh, one of the first black people to ever play at that level in the sport. And we love him in Wigan and we support his is a Tory idea and we shouldn't support it. Thirdly, I would say that makes solidarity even more important. And when you look at the way in which the Tories and others are trying to pit us against some of the poorest people in the world, except that my family spans uh, different parts of the world. My dad is from India, my family are from Lancashire in the UK, and those two sides of my family came together many years ago through the Indian cotton pickers, um, Indian independent movement strike, great personal cost to the Lancashire textile workers, but they stood together because they knew that the system was at fault and not, um, and not working people on the other side of the world. That global agenda couldn't be more important now when we think about issues like fast fashion. It isn't the fault of people in Bolton who go and shop at Primark because their incomes have been slashed by this Tory government. That text, uh, the workers in Bangladesh, garment workers are exploited and we have got to stand up against the people and the system who profit greatly from the exploitation of both. And finally, I would just say there's been a huge emphasis on the media in recent years and whether we need new forms of media um, in order to try to get this message out to people and reach them. I would say that the media, the debate on the media has focused too narrowly in Labour about um, a focus on broadcast and print media. And actually, one of the things that I feel is really important is a new focus on the arts and culture. That is the drumbeat to which politics moves and sets the tone and the wider cultural context in which people think about the world. And while we've seen a real pushback back against some of the Tory narrative in areas like grime, we haven't seen it in the more traditional forms of arts and culture. My dad's generation were responsible for setting up things like the Left Book Club. I know there are some of you in this who will be on this call who are involved in pioneering similar attempts, but I think we need a real push and a real focus on that if we're going to win, because these battles are not going away. And this is one that we really have to win. Thanks very much. OK, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, while we still have you and, and while the connection seems to be uh, uh, reasonable, um, I wanted to get your thoughts on um, Joe's comments about the, uh, the current trajectory of the Labour Party and uh, whether the Labour Party is, as, as he puts it, uh, wrapping itself in, in the flag and, and moving towards a more kind of uh, conventionally uh, patriotic position. Um, and, and also his point that this is really a, a terrain upon which the, the left can only, only lose. Uh, so yeah, I just wonder what your thoughts were uh, about that. So very quickly before I ruin this entire very technically brilliant broadcast by putting out again, um, what I would say is that I, I think there's a big difference between patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism to me is about pulling together in a common cause. It's not about exerting might in the world. It's about shedding light and working with others to try to lift people up together. Nationalism is divisive. It pits people against one another. And I think there's a big difference. And, you know, I represent a town where many young people go off and fight for their country, while I would rather that they were living, not dying for their country, I am proud of those young people because they are standing up for values that they believe in, they are pulling together in common cause, and they go out around the world and they come back and they tell me about the things that they've been doing. Um, you know, going out and working to preserve fragile peace in parts of the world where people don't have it, I used to work with refugees before I came into Parliament and, and I really understand the value of having people, you know, the skill and the expertise of some of our armed forces in going out and doing that. I just think that there's become, this has become a really zero sum game debate in Labour in recent years and I just don't understand why it has to be so. I and other groups were at their most active and you know, in a half Indian family where we were targeted alongside other people, I never understood why we allowed the flag and the notions of a nation that pulls together 
in order to do good in the world, why we allowed that to become appropriated and twisted and distorted by far right organisations. And that's why, you know, when I talked about more ambition today, when Keir talks about more ambition, that's what I mean. Not about endorsing and adopting the values of people on the right, but about standing up for the values that we believe in and people coming together in order to advance those out in the world. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, just just on that for a moment, um, Joe, I was just wondering um, in the comments you made uh, regarding Labour's position on on um, on patriotism, um, what were you thinking about specifically? What, what do you feel? Uh, where do you feel the Labour Party is is going wrong on on this question? And what do you think about that distinction that Lisa makes uh, between uh, patriotism and and nationalism? I think it's perfectly possible for us to articulate a pride in our communities, in our place, in our culture, in our values, without ignoring a lot of what Kojo was saying, which is the history of empire and of the role that Britain has played in the world. And I worry uh, very much that, um, that there's a simplified version um, of what are actually very complex identity issues that just feed into the frames and the narratives of, of Britain first. Um, and of, um, of a certain take on, on patriotism that is a, an arms race we can't win um, on the flag and is a distraction. Um, and I guess the other piece of this, though, is what I was also saying about the, the need to prosecute class war because it's being prosecuted against us. This is not one country unified um, by our culture and values. We've got an extractive economy that, in which there's a ripoff um, spiv. Uh, economy, uh, an extraction of wealth from our communities, a concentration in fewer hands. There's nothing patriotic about the, the class war that's being waged about us, and we shouldn't let that rhetoric uh, predominate. Okay. Um, I might, uh, we might give Lisa a chance to respond to that later, but I'd like to go back to um, the points that Ash was making uh, about Brexit and, uh, and in response to, to your previous comments, Joe. Um, and I just wonder what your thoughts are on this uh, this issue, Kojo, and, and you know, around the question of to what extent did we allow the left to become painted into uh, a corner on the question of Brexit? I mean, I don't think there's anyone, as Ash mentioned, who could look at the election results from 2019 and not say that, you know, the the question around the framing of Brexit and the framing of Labour Party being representative of this kind of metropolitan elite that's removed from the interests of everyday people was a significant factor in the result that it that manifested. But I think there's also a question of, um, you know, how did we as the left engage with the kind of driving impetus to lay behind Brexit, um, you know, with the kind of Lord Ashcroft poll that presented the kind of number one issue that drove people to vote for Brexit, being this question of sovereignty with the kind of, you know, the winning slogan of kind of take back control. Um, I think that it's that question of really engaging with um, that feeling of, you know, well, how was sovereignty kind of removed from not just the nation state in the United Kingdom, but sovereignty in terms of nation states all around the world? How has there been this, um, as the kind of historian Quince Lobodan says, um, encasing of um, private capital wealth and power um, the, the class war that, that Joe mentioned that has been waged upon um, working people by those who own assets and who own resources over the last 40 years. How has that removed the ability to actually wield power and wield democracy within your local community? So I think it's, 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 it's a question of responding to some of those concerns and engaging with those concerns, but also, and this is you know, one thing that I would agree um, with Lisa about, it's about also remaining tied to those principles that you elevate and that you value. And I think for a lot of people who are in the Labour Party, are in the wider left movement, principles such as internationalism, commitment to um, solidarity with migrants, commitment to solidarity with refugees, that these are issues and principles that cannot be compromised upon, even if that does result in, um, yeah, you know, um, difficulties around in, in electability. And so I think that trying to marry those two is, is, is a good starting point in which we might be able to respond to that, to the problems that Labour found themselves in, in relationship to Brexit. Okay, thank you, Kojo. Um, uh, 
for a few minutes, I thought we might just, I might just allow um, the different panelists just to respond as they wish to the different comments uh, that have been been made here, because I don't want to sort of direct it too too closely. So if we start with you, Ash, and then we'll go to Lisa, um, is there anything in particular you'd like to uh, respond to from any of the comments you've heard or a different point that you think is worth making? Yeah, I would really like to come in on this uh, question of patriotism, because I think it's no secret that one of the reasons that Corbyn got clobbered in the press, introduced in the press, and he was painted as a bit of a wrong one, is that his sense of love for this country was always under suspicion, right? Um, and that was the sort of real ongoing theme. And when it comes to Corbyn's relationship, not just to Britain, the country, but Englishness, he's the most English person I could think of. No other culture could have produced this man with a love for allotments and manhole covers, right? Idiosyncratically English. And this brings me back to the question of patriotism and how can one's love for the country that you were born in or you grew up in or you live in be recognized by other people? Because meaning is always socially and historically negotiated. I consider myself someone who for all of its flaws and under-seasoned food. I love English culture. No other culture could have produced someone this obnoxious, right? Not even America. Um, a love for the literature, a love for music. This is all part of having grown up here. But that love for place will never be recognized as patriotism, even if I call it patriotism, because I ultimately reject patriotism as articulated by ruling class ideology. And so for me, the question isn't about the morality of calling oneself a patriot or not. I've got no interest in policing other people's use of language. I think the only thing more boring than talking is talking about other people's talking. What I question is the utility of it. Because unless you have those things being recognized within forms which make sense to people, that patriotism means holding to a certain sense of British exceptionalism. You've got this duality in terms of how you think about empire. We never had one, but if we did, it was a good one. Um, a, a telling of history in which Britain is at once, you know, the plucky underdog and the empire, with, you know, upon which the sun could never set, then you won't be recognized as a patriot. So I don't know how useful it is to articulate one's love for place through that language. I think it's useful for politicians maybe, but thank goodness that's not my job. I'd be terrible at it. Well, let's bring someone in whose job that is. Uh, Lisa, <laughs> do, do you have a response perhaps to that or, or, or also to uh, to Joe's uh, response to you? Um, so I'm really sorry, I didn't hear the, that last bit, but I did love Ash's point about no other culture could have produced someone so... <laughs> No, I think we. Yeah, I think we may have lost Lisa and, there. Um, and I think I think these nuanced points about. Sorry, I'm. I don't know if you can hear. Me. I'm really ruining this broadcast, aren't I? I, ju I just wanted to say that I, I think this nuanced debate about patriotism and about culture, um, and about what Englishness is, is really important. And the political culture that we've allowed to grow up has really airbrushed all of the nuance from that conversation where we've allowed people to be divided as enemies against um, friends. And I really appreciate the way in which this debate is being held. I think it's really important. And I think that the left has a particular responsibility to have this kind of debate where we're challenging to one another, but we allow that nuance and complexity to come through. Now, that was part of the point that I was trying to make about arts and culture as well, because I think sometimes the broadcast media, the Print media. It doesn't have this too. I have friends in the Parliamentary Labour Party who challenged me on in the wider movement. And the you know, the ability of us to rise above and transcend the political culture and the poison that has been allowed to enter that is going to be really, really important if we're going to not just get a next Labour government elected, but actually de demonstrate that Ash was talking about. So you know, thank, thank you from me, and I will now stop trying to ruin your, your thing with my dodgy Wi-Fi on the train um, and go back to the debate. 
Okay, thanks, Lisa. I think I think we caught all of that really. Um, so we've got about ten minutes more of the discussion between the panelists. So uh, let's go to, uh, to to you, Joe. Uh, do you have any other comments uh, on, on what you've heard so far? Yeah, just to pick up on something that both Kojo and Lisa said, which I think is really important here, which is really the um, the area of culture and political education popular education, the need to understand our history more and how we relate um, to that past and, and to how it continues to shape our future. And then Lisa mentioned um, the book club, uh, the left book club and the arts. And I think one of the huge missed opportunities of the past five years was really not taking that enormous surge in membership um, and in, in the growth of the movement and being able to turn out into community and to do work in community on the ground that, w that would have had numerous benefits, I think. On the one hand, we would have deepened understanding of our analysis of the crisis at the moment, of what's really going on in the economy, of the, of the things that people are feeling and that they're right to feel that really are about loss of control and loss of economic sovereignty and loss of the ability um, to direct the future um, of our communities and our, our economies. But it would also, I think, have put us in touch and, and given us a much better sense of what was coming in the red wall and what some of those concerns were and not allowed us, I think, to make some of the tactical and strategic mistakes that we've made because we would have had deeper organic relationships um, to those communities. And I, I accept that uh, in many ways, this is a, a conversation about England um, that we're having now. I think there's a different conversation to be had about Scotland, about Northern Ireland, but there's also work to be done there. I think the, you know, part of the, the problem of the framing of the Brexit debate and the conversation about the European Union is that we've actually absorbed a lot of neoliberal economics on the left in the way in the which we think about how the world operates and what the parameters of the possible are. And, and, and a deep uh, reassessment and engagement with political education and with what's really happening at the community level, I think, would, would help us to build our institutions and, and allow us to start developing our own culture so that we don't have to operate entirely within hostile channels. Uh, and, you know, alternative media is going to be a really important part of this. There's been a lot of growth of that um, in, in recent years. I'd like to see that wired deeply into community in a different way. And perhaps we can think about how to do that. Okay, thank you, Joe. And uh, let's go to, to you, Kojo. Do you have any further further thoughts? I think what I'd like to do really is just to briefly kind of respond to the, the provocation that Lisa really presented us with, which is, you know, this kind of imploring to recapture the language of patriotism, to recapture this idea of pride in the nation and take it away from the sphere of the far right, take it away from the xenophobia or the racism that's, that, that, that seems to have underpinned it um, over the last however many years. You know, I think that whilst this is a nice idea, it, it really underestimates the extent to which um, these issues around migration, these issues around xenophobia have really um, infected the language of particularly English nationalism, but also nationalism more at large in this country, you know, over at least the cause of the entirety of my life. Um, this question of migration has really been um, a driver of a lot of politics. Um, you know, I, in terms of the story about kind of all of us together and us unifying, I, um, you know, I really, I, I thought maybe just for a brief second, for a brief for a second at the start of the pandemic, you know, the start of um, the, what seemed like potentially an existential crisis um, where uh, you know, the, there was a real fear about, you know, what this unknown virus would do and how it would impact on people's lives. But there might be a dialing down from this kind of um, relentless migrant bashing and xenophobia that we've seen within a lot of our major newspapers and by a lot of our major politicians. Um, but, you know, even when we were all safely cocooned within our own houses and a lot of the kind of hard essential work was being done by migrants and i'm not just talking about you know the healthcare professionals of who you know the first eight of which to die from covid 19 were all migrants um not just talking about the care workers but also talking about the delivery um uh, food delivery drivers and the service users a lot of those migrants were doing that essential work i thought that maybe for a moment there might be a little bit of a dial down in that kind of anti migrant rhetoric that might be a little bit of a reflection by a lot of the the, the 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 commentators that we all know in the media who've made such hayway and built such careers upon this idea of you know a threat to europe coming from from the migrant um the, the, the migrant uh, population but it was a few weeks later just a few weeks later and all of a sudden 
The newspapers were filled with threats of migrant boats arriving from Dover. Again, the idea of the nation state having to cohere itself and defend its borders from the, 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 the dangerous, um, you know, un, untamed migrant. And, you know, even within the context of a kind of unknown pandemic, you know, where you might not, you know, not know what the kind of the, the, the illness that you're suffering with and what long-term effects it might have upon you, you know, there's still time to concern themselves with this question around, you know, who is British, what is British identity? And there's in fact been a doubling down on that. Um, and, you know, so I think that that really shows the kind of strength of um, the capturing of nationalism that we are, um, you know, competing against. And I think that we need to not just try and engage on that terrain with the right, but really try and think about new framings and new forms of solidarity that might be able to exceed that. Great, thank you, Kojo. Um, I think Ash uh, had a comment on that as well. I mean, so I th for me, this comes back to a question about the lack of shared cultural coordinates for what constitutes the working class in this country. Um, that fragmenting, that cultural fragmentation, geographic fragmentation has been a project long in the making by the right to make it difficult to organize and to win and to secure concessions. And there are two things that very briefly uh, I want to touch on. One is about the migrant workforce. So there is a huge growth of precarious migrant work doing what is often called low skilled work is actually just low paid and low status work. And that's in care, that's in logistics, that's in food production, it's in hospitality. These are all the jobs which society could not live without during the pandemic. And yet at the same time, you had this ongoing process of demonizing migrants. But when it comes to the challenges for organizing in those spaces and with that section of the workforce, it is intensely challenging because these are some of the hardest workplaces to organize in precisely because they've been made so precarious. Um, you take, for example, an ongoing dispute uh, by the Baker's Union who've been organizing within a Northampton uh, food production factory that does the sandwiches for M&S. There was um, an outbreak of coronavirus there. They're working in really dangerous conditions where you can socially distance, then huge pressure on this workforce to go back. And one of the things really inhibiting organizing is that one, you've got high turnover. So you've got people who are, for an average are working maybe five or six months in this setting. Two, you've got a lack of a shared language. So it's not just, oh, you know, in lack of shared English, as you've got Romanian, you've got Russian, you've got Polish, you've got all these things which, you know, the lack of the shared cultural coordinates challenge the effectiveness of workplace organizing. And three, you've got a trade union movement, which is still incredibly English focused in terms of the English language, resistant to, to learning these new skills to organize with these really precarious workforce. And it's no surprise that the most highly engaged members of the union are also ones who speak the best English. So I think it's also about the challenge presented to the labor movement and to the left to not think in such anglof instinctively anglophone uh, and anglocentric terms and thinking about, you know, the the crisis represented by lack of shared cultural coordinates, I think some of these really practical organizing questions, which will necessitate us to learn new skills, right, to deal with the fact that trade union organizing is being done with a highly uh, transitory and highly precarious workforce. And that is the, the front line, I think, especially in this post COVID economy, where you will have, I think, you know, just huge amounts of people shoved into warehouse distribution, logistics work, um, I think more and more. The second thing very briefly is about the economic sovereignty. Sovereignty is not a race-less concept. It's not entirely racialized. That's not all it is, but it is not race-less. And it hasn't been from the very start. You know, you go back to, you know, you read the classics of political theory in your Thomas Hobbes, or he, he owned chairs in the Virginia plantation. That was an image for what sovereignty looked like. So it's right there lodged in the political imaginary. And the loss of sovereignty is not articulated through uh, the restrictions of state aid policy. It's literally seeing people who are racialized as migrants, regardless of whether or not those people are actually migrants. Um, and this goes well before Brexit. Uh, 
I was doing some research and I was reading about a local council election in the early 2000s where the BNP were feared that they were going to do well. And this is kind of around Broxbourne and Thurrock and that kind of, you know, the white flight ring around London. You've got people who are saying, I'm not in control of my life. I'm not in control of my community. And I know this because I can see asylum seekers picking up their gyro at the post office. And then the journalists went back and did some research and it turned out there wasn't a, a single asylum seeker in Broxport. It was literally just seeing brown people at the post office and freaking out. And this is something which Nigel Farage knows very, very well, because he's playing these games of racialized imagery, brown men, you know, dirty, illegitimate humanity in the small boats coming here. And they're a threat because they're an impingement on sovereignty. And so I think one of the things that the left has to recognize is that even when it moves onto the terrain of sovereignty, simply trying to use the dry language of economics is not enough in terms of the register of feeling that people are already operating on. And so I think in order to deal with it, we need to, again, fully appreciate the challenges that we face. OK, uh, thank you, Ash. I think we've just got 20 minutes left. Um, so we're going to go to audience uh, questions. Um, the first question we have, um, the right uh, has successfully claimed freedom for itself, uh, whereas the left seems like uh, it's nagging at people. Um, yet the free market is not freeing. It traps us in low paid work and misery. Uh, how can we reclaim the idea of freedom for uh, the left? Um, so, if we could, um, if we could go to uh, Lisa, what are your thoughts on that question? I don't think Lisa can hear us. Uh, would anyone else like to jump in? Oh, hello, Lisa. Okay, I think we should we should go to someone else. Uh, would someone else like to jump in? Sure. Um, and I think this is probably an instance where we need to start actually. Shall I let Lisa? Can you hear us, Lisa? Again? Okay, I, th I think you should go ahead, Joe. Oh, sure. I, I think the, the neoliberals have done a really good job of creating a very dense paradigm um, that has a lot of meaning and a lot of resonance on the street after four decades, uh, aided by the, the media, by academia, by the, the kind of narrowing of the horizons of our, our understanding. And we've really got to do a better job of unpacking those paradigms and posing what's really going on behind the curtain um, of neoliberalism. So when they talk about freedom, um, really, there's the claim that the free markets will self-regulate. Um, but what actually is going on is unfreedom for others. And what we need to do is counterpose our vision of freedom. And our vision of freedom is emancipatory. It's about human development as the new face of freedom and how that requires the removal of unfreedom, such as poverty and lack of opportunity. And I think we could go through many of the other elements of the, the neoliberal paradigm in, in the same way and begin to, to counterpose what's really happening under, under the current order and what we offer as, a, as an alternative. Okay. Um, thank you, Joe. Um, so we're going to go to our next question. Um, so how much, um, sorry, uh, how much of the culture wars is real? Uh, how much is imagined by conservatives? How much of it is repackaged conservative, uh, conservative and reactionary values? Uh, and I, I suppose uh, something to think about here is, is a question of temporality. You know, when did the culture wars uh, begin, how much is new in what we're seeing right now? After all, uh, discussion around um, uh, the, the loony left is something we we, uh, we can recall from the 1980s. Um, so if we go to uh, Kojo, what are your thoughts on that, Kojo? I mean, I think that obviously these things come with a genealogy and there is a history of the cultural wars, um, not only within the UK, but within almost all of the Western countries. But I do think that this is, this is starting a kind of a, a, a new trajectory. Um, one that I mentioned in the start of my presentation really derives from the um, value that was placed in the culture wars by um, the kind of, uh, the, 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 the so-called kind of radical American right, um, you know, kind of Andrew Breitbart, um, Steve Bannon, people who really saw this lineage of um, 
uh, kind of American conservatism being opposed primarily against what they deemed as the legacy of the new left in the American universities, the, the legacy of, you know, Herbert Marcuse, the Frankfurt School, and the way that, that bled into the, um, the, the a lot of the, the, the kind of culture um, wars, culture tensions of the 1960s. And this was kind of repackaged and regenerated within the 1990s. It was really an attempt to try and bring together that coalition, that winning coalition within um, kind of US conservatism. I think that that's very much being learned and parachuted over here within the United Kingdom. Um, you know, we're seeing um, the, 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 the kind of cultural wars in the UK target institutions of conservatism that are supposed to be, you know, the heart of the kind of British establishment, not just universities, but also the Supreme Court, you know, the BBC, you know, these are becoming targets of, 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 of you know, Telegraph and Spectator commentators everywhere. So I do think this is, there is something quite new here, um, something quite interesting, but also something that we need to be careful in how we engage with it. Okay, thank you, uh, Kojo. Um, I wonder, Joe, um, given that you will know uh, the American context uh, a little better, and, and obviously, you know, the, the the culture wars is a term that was long associated with politics in, in the United States, and, and uh, generally is 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 put is uh, placed um, in the 1990s and and um, the, the Clinton administration. Um, so, do you have any thoughts on on the um, that question of the um, uh, the development of, of of the culture wars over time? Um, I'm not a student of the culture wars, um, and this is certainly getting you know far afield from uh, a lot of my area of expertise. But um, it really feels like um, it's been accelerated in in sort of the last decade or so by an enormous uh, intentional effort um, to really um, to to and, and with a lot of resources behind it. And so we're just thinking about taking on institutions and, and changing them, even um, what formerly might have been important institutions to the establishment. The, the right has, for example, in the area of the courts, um, has done an inordinate amount of organizing in the United States, um, far beyond the capacity of, of the left to compete. Um, foundations have put money into training programs that have now reached half of the US judiciary, right? It's not just the Supreme Court that we have a problem with for decades to come, uh, but the, the entire judiciary behind them, um, such that there was a recent law review piece that looked at a million um, court decisions on e economics and whether the judge involved had been through these training programs or not. Um, and in half of them they had, and that exponentially increased the likelihood of certain concepts, certain values, certain frames, certain arguments coming forward. And I think the scale uh, of this and the, the degree to which it's been uh, underpinned by corporate financial power and by a very deliberate political strategy is just is something that's only becoming clearer to me at the moment. So I don't know if that speaks to your, your question. Okay, thanks, Joe. That's yeah, that's very interesting. Um, so uh, we're going to go to our next question. So, um, is it possible to redefine Brexit so as to make it progressive uh, by fighting for free movement and putting forward a strategy for a left anti-nationalist version of European uh, disintegration? Uh, I presume uh, the person asking the question uh, doesn't have uh, a lot of optimism for the uh, survival of, of the European Union in uh, the long term. Um, and obviously the stability or otherwise of the European Union is something that we should be uh, be thinking about. Um, I wonder if, uh, Ash, if you have any thoughts on that uh, question. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I want to say is that I thought that me and Joe were going to have a big bus stop, and here I am like a nodding dog at the back of a car. Um, I agree with everything that he said in terms of um, culture wars being the result of, of a Gramscian project. It's not simply about winning elections. It's about transforming every institution uh, which shapes public life. Um, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, as for Brexit, that's yesterday's war. And it really is. You can talk about life after Brexit. You can talk about the detail of the trade agreements. I think you can talk about, um, you know, what is going to be sort of carved up like a Christmas turkey and served up to, you know, American healthcare corporations. But in terms of tr fighting to define Brexit, that has been defined by the public with an 80 seat majority, whether we whether we like it or not. And I think that that opportunity, if it ever existed, and I think this is the bit which I go back and forth on, has been lost. Um, but what we can talk about is accepting the fact of that referendum result, accepting the fact that, um, you know, parliamentary 
democracy and oversight even is not really in the driver's seat about what's going to happen next. We can talk about the country that we want, which is outside of the European Union. So that's no longer a battle over Brexit, I think. You're on mute, Alex. Sorry, I was on mute, everybody. Um, uh, yes, uh, Lisa, I just wondered if you had any uh, thoughts on this question around uh, around Brexit. Okay, I'm not sure we have uh, Lisa. So maybe if we go to uh, another question. Uh, this is quite an interesting one. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the person asking the question is driving at, but um, the question is, um, how do we link economic injustice in localities inside the Red Wall uh, with, uh, with, with the inequality in the global south? Um, now, it might have been good to ask uh, Lisa this question, given uh, that her constituency is Wigan. Uh, Lisa, can you hear us? Um, I can, yeah. I'm really Okay. Again, um, um, I, I only heard half. The, the point about yeah. So the the, uh, the question is, how do we link economic injustice in localities inside the Red Wall uh, with inequality in the global south? So I guess I guess what I would say is that there's grown up a very stereotypical view of what people think in the Red Wall. And actually, I think this is the opportunity for Labour is that I don't think that the Tories really understand the constituencies that they've just won the right to represent in the general election, because um, many of those towns. have had global links for uh, over a century, whether it was the textile mills, whether it was the mine, they may have come to a very different conclusion to me about membership of the European Union, but often that was for reasons of solidarity, not reasons of wanting to break apart and separate from the rest of the world. And so I think we have to have a much more nuanced understanding of what people think. There is very strong support for the UK playing a role in the world but the role in the world that people in those towns want to see us play is one that tackles global poverty and brings working class people together to stand together against a system that oppresses people here and oppresses people around the world, rather than a, a system that benefits global financiers. When, uh, when David Laramane one of the first things he heard from somebody in a local library was that he voted leave in the end because he didn't like the way that Greece was treated and he thought there ought to be more global solidarity. There were a lot of people in Westminster who could not believe that that was a true story. That tells me that there is a real disconnect between some, grown up a real disconnect between some people on the left and some people and the people that we represent. And actually, the hope and the optimism lies in the fact that um, British people are far more nuanced about the way that they see the, the world and our place in it than the Tories would have us believe. And I think that is the great trap for the left, is that we fall into their pessimism and their cynicism, rather than understanding that when people break apart, it's because people feel insecure and dealing with the root causes of that insecurity plus going out and winning the argument about how you bring people back together is the real job of the left. That is the sort of leadership that I want to see us go out and show to win the argument where it's hard, but also to deal with the root causes of, um, of that insecurity rather than fall into this idea that people that can be written off, that they can be stereotyped, but actually often the truth is very, very different. Okay, thank you, uh, Lisa. We've just got five minutes left, so we've only really got time for a couple more questions. Um, the next one, is it, and we sort of touched on this a little bit, but is it possible to conceive of a, uh, a left-wing patriotism uh, devoid of the imperial nostalgia and exclusion? Uh, and what even is the point of it uh, as people who uh, love flags and um, are, are typically very into imperial nostalgia and exclusion? So um, is there really... Uh, any progressive um, 
you know any any sort of uh, progressive feeling to be to be found amongst those demographics who are drawn into uh, notions of, of patriotism. Um, and I'll go to uh, you, Kojo. I think. I mean, I just feel like we continually keep coming back to the same debate about the potential of left wing patriotism, without looking at the global context in which nationalism is emerging in this contemporary moment, the history of kind of left internationalism, and a lot of how the moments of, um, you know, kind of transnational solidarity that Lisa was just talking about, particularly those that happened, you know, in the north of England, which is where I still grew up, um, on those that were framed and generated with this language of kind of left-wing patriotism, progressive patriotism, you know, this isn't the only frame through which we can kind of constitute our politics. Um, I think that, you know, what we need to be thinking about is, yeah, can we conceive of new kind of strains of solidarity when we're talking about things like um, the relationship between um, economic um, devastation that was visited upon the global south, particularly after the kind of third world debt crisis and um, the, the kind of imposition of neoliberalism that we should remember happened first in the global south, first in places like Mexico and Jamaica, and of course Chile, before being then imported into the global north. Um, when we're talking about those histories, I don't think that we need to frame those within the language of left-wing patriotism. I think that there is an already um, rich and powerful history of kind of yeah, left-wing internationalism and left-wing solidarity. And talking about, you know, as Joe mentioned, the way in which court decisions in places like the United States, but very much so in places like the United Kingdom, you know, when we're talking about the, the in terms of the law and in terms of finance to many, in many ways, still the center of empire today, still London Commercial Court is the center of transnational um, uh, corporate um, uh, yeah, kind of legalization legislation um, still. <laughs> The city of London is and British overseas territories at the center for kind of global money laundering. We are talking about a place in which we can affect change within this country, but one that's going to have significant impacts for people all around the world. And I don't think we need the language of patriotism to do that. And I quickly can I quickly add to that? I think the minute you start trying to talk about left wing patriotism, you reduce what could be a really exciting discussion about forms of identity, hybridity, progressive and radical values into the most boring shape ever. Because you essentially go, would this fit in a great British Bake Off tent? Would it look in place there? If not, it's not going to be recognised British patriotism until we move. And I think that the really exciting stuff about cultural hybridity, which is why I think what Stuart Hall is someone who got so right, which is regardless actually of whether you're a person of colour or whether you're white British, that outer history of the empire is embedded within everything we know about Englishness and Britishness. So he said, I'm the sugar at the bottom of the English cup of tea. Uh, you know, others are where the tea was grown, not a single leaf grows in this country. It comes from Ceylon, it comes from India. And so, and what do we know about the English? They can't get through the day without their cup of tea. So it's about that collapsing of the, you know, hinterland and metropole histories of, of, of empire these are all going on at once the other thing that I kind of want to talk about because we've talked about arts and we, we, we've talked a bit about music is that we always forget to talk about sports right we always forget to talk about sport and this uh, you know progressive patriotism is a meaning latching onto the sight of an almost entirely black French team winning the world cup within a context of you know racial violence, and police violence in France perpetrated against black men, again, collapses what's going on there. What goes on in this country, again, of, you know, the overlap between sports culture and, you know, music and street fashion, it's flattened when you try and understand it as patriotism. It becomes much richer when you think about um, kinds of, of, of cultural many voicedness of overlaps of, of contact at the periphery that happens when you've got communities of color establishing themselves, uh, you know, in the former imperial heartland. And I want to have those conversations with the richness and the dexterity and also like the fun that it deserves. And you miss all of those things when you try and package it up in patriotism, I think. Patriotism's boring is my TLDR. 
Okay. Uh, well, we're just about at time that uh, at the end of the time there, so that seems like uh, yeah a good place to uh, to stop. Um, so thank you to all of the uh, to all of our excellent panel this evening, and to everyone who's attended, and for all your very interesting questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to uh, to all of them. Uh, just a couple of things uh, before we sign off. Um, so if you'd like to continue the discussion, uh, we've set up a dedicated space in our community forum. Uh, if you've already set up your account, you can click the link that should be posted in the chat uh, to find the relevant discussion thread. Um, if, you are, if you're registered for the festival, uh, check your email for your sign-up link to the forum. Uh, if you're unable to find a sign-up link, please email info at theworldtransformed.org. Uh, remember, there are lots of other events um, from now up until the end of the month, uh, and those events are filling up very quickly. So be sure to register for any that you'd like to attend uh, as soon as possible. So uh, make sure you've registered for the festival at theworldtransform.org forward slash register, and then go to the individual event uh, that you'd like to register for on the program. Um, and finally, if you enjoyed this session and would like to help us sustain our work uh, throughout this festival and beyond, uh, please do consider supporting us at theworldtransform.org forward slash support. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. View the full TWT20 program and become a supporter today to help us deliver political education all year round at theworldtransformed.org.